Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. And this evening's discussion is Nehane or Nirvana Day. Um, and, you know, I, when I was looking at this picture earlier and I thought to myself, all the pictures I see of Shakyamuni Buddha laying that posture, which is symbolic of his dying, um, all look exactly like they do when they're showing his awakening under the Bodhi tree in terms of his age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't look like he's 80 years no. old there. I, I, I was, and I don't think I'd ever thought about it before, but mm -hmm. I've never seen an old Shakyamuni Buddha mm -hmm. in a pair of Nirvana pose. Mm -hmm. And they did, they did describe it that he, he, he had, he was gotten very elderly. He, and like, he was very ill. He was, yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so why don't we get, go ahead and, and get started with this. And as an overview, Pier Nirvana Day is celebrated by Japanese Buddhist Nehane on the 15th of February. Some schools actually celebrate it on the 8th. And to be candid with you, I don't know why. But there it is. A brief explanation of the terms of Nirvana and Pier Nirvana might be helpful because sometimes we'll see the term Pier Nirvana and sometimes we'll see Nirvana. And I go into this a little bit more, but very briefly, Nirvana is attainable by practitioners on the path to enlightenment. Uh, but parinirvana is reserved for those who have reached the pinnacle of spiritual realization, such as the Buddha. When translating from East Asian Buddhism, this term is used interchangeably. So you'll see people saying parinirvana or nirvana, and they're really talking about the same, if they're talking about Shakyamuni Buddha, they're talking about the same um, uh, event. And just a reminder that in East Asian Buddhism, Shakyamuni Buddha's birth, death, and day of enlightenment are celebrated on separate days based upon a consensus of the dates of the occurrence. For South Asia and Tibetan Buddhists, all three events are celebrated together as Vesak, usually in May, based upon the lunar calendar. Um, and that Vesak is an approximation of the day of, of Siddhartha Gautama's birth. And I think one of the, the distinctions I would make also is that in many of the Buddhist countries in South Asia, it's a national holiday, Vesak being a national holiday, uh, as opposed to giving three days, which are not national holidays in China or Japan, etc. Um, Nirvana Day commemorates the death of the historical Buddha and his entry into the final or complete Nirvana. And one of the things to keep in mind also that this is viewed as a celebration rather than as a memorial. At temples and monasteries, it's a time for contemplation of the Buddhist teachings. Some hold meditation sessions, meaning longer periods of time. And others open their doors to lay people to bring in gifts and household goods to support the monks and nuns. And that's especially true in South Asia. It's also a time for pilgrimages to temples and other sacred sites in East Asia. In India, there are four sites for pilgrimages, and this is in the Maha uh, Parinavana Sutra they, of, the, of Mahayana. They suggest these four sites for pilgrimages. One where he was born, Labimi, mm -hmm. it, which was his awakening at the place of his awakening, Bodhagaya, the place of the first teaching, Sarnath, and the place of his death, Kushnagari. Oops, hold on, no, let me see if I can get it to do its thing. Here, here we go. Okay. So, well, let's start by looking at the Nikaya accounts, early Buddhist accounts. And there are different accounts of how Shakyamuni Buddha died. One can see how such a momentous event would have broader implications based upon his teachings and how his disciples, their disciples, etc wished him to be remembered. According to legend, Shakyamuni Buddha gathered his disciples, chose the time of his death, and poisoned himself so as to die at the time of his choosing. Or did he die of natural causes at the age of 80 after teaching for 45 years? What's interesting is both versions of the death of the Buddha are endorsed by scholars, and it's difficult to separate the epic versions from what may have actually occurred. 
Some evidence suggests he died from mesenteric infarction, an often fatal condition of the intestines not uncommon in elderly people. Some scholars, there we go, based upon the same text that I just mentioned, suggest that he died from eating tainted pork, while others from eating poisonous mushrooms. It should be pointed out here that the actual century years, let alone the dates of Shakyamuni Buddha's birth and death, are not known. He lived, according to scholars in the South Asian traditions, between the 6th and 5th centuries BCE, and according to East Asian and Tibetan scholars, between the 5th to 4th centuries BCE. Keep in mind, as I've mentioned numerous times before, that the concept of history, as it's perceived con contemporaneously, was established starting in the 19th century. Before that, so-called objective recounting of events, legend and myths, were referred to as history. There was not a distinction made between them. Though there was a recognition that histories, however we view it, always held the bias of the teller or the writer. That hasn't changed. We do know that a historical person lived and died, meaning Shakyamuni Buddha, and we know that his life, where his life took place. We have a record of his teachings and many of his disciples, the philosophies and the practice he had, practices he advocated. And the earliest recounting of his death is found in the Mahaparabhanama Sutra, a sutta, 16 of the Diga Nikaya. This is the longest discourse of the Pali Canon. In six chapters, it describes the last year of Buddha's life. It is equally possible that the text was originally intended as a hagiography, not as a historical record of events. In addition to the events leading up to Buddha's death and what followed, there are a number of foundational uh, Buddhist teachings that are reiterated in that particular sutta. In other words, the recounting of the death was seen as an opportunity for a further elaboration of the teachings that were deemed important at that time. And in great detail, it describes Buddha's death and cremation. Oh, wait, we didn't get to the last one. Oh, did you hit it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Technical gloop. Anyway, um, I will recount a version found in the Pali Canon. Please recognize that there are different narratives and even more interpretations, and I don't favor one narrative over the other, just a sharing of a summary story that is found in the Pali Canon. And this is a greatly shortened version. Shakyamuni Buddha journeyed with Ananda. Ananda was one of his two uh, aides, um, his personal attendant, from Rajga to Kashinagari in 14 stages and gave teachings in two different audiences. And the teachings are provided in the discourses that are recounted at each of these uh, stages. The subjects of these teachings were on the Sangha governance, the unity of the Sangha, morality, the Four Noble Truths, etc. What's interesting, I think, about that is that in, this, in that particular sutra, there was an incredible amount of, of um, detail about how Shakyamuni Buddha felt that the Sangha should be governed. It was really a very uh, important document regarding Sangha as a whole. Um, at 80 years old, he had become progressively more ill, and he uses deep meditation to keep his diseases in check. He describes his body as being like an old cart held together by straps. Hmm. And personally, I find this fascinating because it speaks to the interaction, the interplay between one's physical well-being and one's mental states. And what I mean by that is that at that time, they were saying that he went into deep samadhi as a way to deal with his illnesses. So it was recognizing the connection between the body and the mind uh, very Im importantly at that point. The Buddha tells Ananda he would like to address the Sangha. And Ananda thought he was going to teach something that he had never taught. However, Buddha says that he had already revealed everything there is to teach, but nonetheless, Ananda assembled the disciples. And then after a series of teachings and an encounter with Mara, delusion, 
he requests the last meal from the blacksmith Kunda called Pig's Delight. And this is where scholarly discussion as to what Shakyamuni Buddha died from is centered. Was it actually minced pig meat that was often used at that time in that part of the world? Or mushrooms, which pigs enjoy? He also instructed his disciples not to share the meal with him and that the meal should be buried after his death so that none of the disciples could eat it. And this is what points to the fact that it may very well have been poisoned. Not intentionally by Kunda, that is to say that none should eat it, not intentionally by Kunda, but by Shakyamuni Buddha himself. This reinforced the idea that Shakyamuni Buddha poisoned the meal himself. Today, this would be viewed as voluntary euthanasia. Shortly after the meal, Buddha travels outside the town. He lies down between two solid trees, which are blooming out of season, instructs Ananda to visit Kunda to reassure him that he was not to blame for his death and that he should rejoice at having given Buddha his last meal. Asking the monks, laity, and divinity assembled if they had any questions, there were none. And he tells them, these are the last words, all conditioned things are subject to decay. Strive with diligence, and he dies. Great last words. You know, I, I hope that, with, that when I'm drawing my last breath, I have the wherewithal to say something as profound as that. I'll probably say something like, oh, shit. <laughs> but nonetheless. Yeah. <laughs> So after his death, it is recounted that the Buddha's consciousness passed through various stages of dhyana in the various realms of materiality, semi-materiality, and immateriality, up and down and through the, the eight levels. And then seven days later, later, his body was prepared for cremation. His disciples waited to start cremation until Maha Kasyapa who had been away, returned. When he returned, the funeral pyre ignited spontaneously. <laughs> so the relic, the relics of Buddha's remains uh, after cremation were apportioned to eight kings to carry back to their kingdoms. Originally, his ashes were to go only to the Shakya clan to which the Buddha belonged. However, six other clans and a king demanded the ashes of the Buddha in order to re, uh, re, de, demanded the ashes of the Buddha. In order to resolve the dispute, a Brahmin named Drona divided the ashes up into eight portions. It is from the seven of these, the seven of the eight collection of bones, that King Ashoka obtained the 64,000 relics that were later dispersed throughout Asia. Just as a side note, the Ramagurama Stupa in Lubumi, his birthplace, is said to be one of the eight places where the relics of Buddha's body were put after his cremation. It is the only one that has never been opened. Legend says that King Ashoka, Emperor Ashoka, came to the Stupa at Ramagurama in 249 BCE and planned to open it and retrieve the relics of the Buddha. But when he arrived, he had a vision of a snake god that told him not to interfere with the site. And so he left it alone and worshipped at it instead. And that stupa is still in Lubimi today. Uh, so that's the at least an eighth of the bones that were set aside as relics. Let's look at the Mahayana version of this. The Mahayana Nirvana Sutra was the first, the first Sanskrit versions are dated about three, third century CE, and several Chinese translations, Fashian, Dharmashika, appeared in the fifth century based upon different Sanskrit sources. Translations of the Mahabharata Suttana were translated in Chinese, but this is not the same sutra as the Mahayana Nirvana Sutra, so we have to keep in mind that the Pali version and the Mahayana version are 
completely different versions of his death, the cremation, what happened later, etc. The former, based upon the Pali, the latter one on the more influent, is one of the most influential sutras in East Asia. Um, considered, along with the Lotus Sutra, a complete teaching by Chi Gi. And so the uh, Parinirvana Sutra, the Nirvana Sutra, and the Lotus Sutra are the two complete teachings that were taught from, from Chi Gi. Many of the events of the last year of Shakyamuni Buddha's life are the same between the two. Did that, did that do it or not? That didn't do it. There we go. Uh, many of the events of the last year of Shakyamuni Buddha's life are the same. Though the Mahayana versions are expanded upon and the death of the Buddha is not the core theme. So it's interesting that the Nirvana Sutra doesn't have his death as the core theme. Uh, it's prominent but it's not the primary import of the sutra. The Buddha asserts in this sutra that he will disappear from sight, but will not die. Because, in fact, he was never born in the first place. Buddhas are not created phenomena and therefore have no beginning and no end. This is also the basis of a different notion of Shakyamuni Buddha. In this notion, his teachings remain in the form of sutra. His disciples who pass on the teachings, etc. There is less lionization of Shakyamuni Buddha than in the Pali Canon, but more of an imaginative narrative. And the core theme in the Mahayana Sutra is the Tathagata Garbha and Shunyata. Tathagata Garbha is the awakening that resides within everyone, and of course, uh, Shunyata, emptiness. And it expresses this as Buddha's nature, Buddha nature, Tathagata nature and the hidden treasury, and hold that this is true not only of the Buddhas, but of all living things. The death of Shakyamuni Buddha has a great deal to tell us about the Buddha path or Shasana, the term that would be used for uh, Buddhism is really sort of an awkward term um, that we use in English. Um, shasana referred to just the path as opposed to referring to a, a person. Um, the century, year, and date, as I said before, are less important. It is important that we mark the event. And I've provided an extremely edited version of Shakyamuni Buddha's Mahaparinirvana referring to the Pali and Sanskrit in summary. The recounting of the last year of Buddha's life could include the 14 separate discourses to different audiences in different places. The Buddha crossing a river using his magical powers and describing to this distraught where the deceased loved ones have been reborn, all from the Pali Canon. This is a kind of introduction to Buddhism itself. And so I, I think that one of the reasons that we see the three separate uh, major events, milestones in Shakyamuni Buddha's life, his birth, his awakening, and his death are, are kept separate. I think that, that part of the reason for this is because it provides an opportunity to recount the teachings. Now, uh, and I say that because we're all sitting here this evening either online or in person, and we do that once a week. If you're in Asia, you don't gather weekly. You gather several times a year. You gather at New Year's, you gather at Obon. And if you are a devoted practitioner, you're going to gather during Vesak if it's South Asia or if it's East Asia, it'll be his birth, awakening, and, and death. And so you got an audience during those periods of time, make use of it <laughs> and teach what we might listen to on a weekly basis. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why we see in East Asia that they count it more often, whereas in South Asia. And, and, and also keep in mind that, that outside of, of Asia, the recounting of Shakyamuni Buddha's um, events, milestones, whether it doesn't matter which one, you know, I, I'm thinking about, about you, Chip, are taken at face value. And they're taking it at face value, you know, and, and you stop and think about it. We're in the United States. 
I've seen estimates that 75 percent of the American population does not believe in biological evolution. Seventy five percent. And when you go to Japan, when I would say that to the Japanese people, they were established because of 100 percent believe in biological evolution. And yet, and here's the point that I'm making, they'll take the idea of the events of Shakyamuni Buddha's milestones at face value. And that's partly, well, Tamami's shaking her head, but I think that, I don't think, I would say that they don't take it at face value, they don't question it. They just don't question it. That's the point. Okay. Why bother to question it? And I think that we have a false sense of rational. One of my favorite phrases is, the human beings are not rational, they are rationalizers. We rationalize rather than think rationally. We're emotional. And well, human beings are, are, are emotional, exactly. And so when I say that in, in East Asia, just as an example, I don't know as much about South Asia, why would you question what is said in there? Why would you even want, why would you even think about it? I mean, does it make a difference? <laughs> you know, I'm not saying just a chip, but in general, does it really make a difference? It's a way of demonstrating, which is true of all hagiographies, it's a way of demonstrating the outstanding nature of that particular character. In the same way that, that we have hagiography about George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or Albert Einstein or any number of other characters. Um, um, interestingly, by the way, I just read a very interesting novel called, called um, Oh, well, now, I'm, now I'm forgetting the name, but it was, it was about Einstein that had to do with how he actually came up with, with his mm. ideas of relativity, etc. They all came from um, not necessarily rational processes. Mm. And years they of, came through imagine. I'm sorry. I was going to say, it's a lot of years of contemplation, too. Like, he just well, liked to it, walk around in nature a lot. Yeah, he would put himself in a partic particular situation and, and look at a clock and say, what is time really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. He didn't. He didn't experiment. Mm -hmm. These were all thoughts experiments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it didn't happen out of a vacuum. I mean, was no. was a was himself a product of an, evo ev an evolution of thought? Well, and and keep in mind that he barely got through college. Yeah. And he flunked his early years of math, and yet he did those miraculous things. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, So, in the West, we give very little attention to the three events of Shakyamuni Buddha's life, and that may be hmm? oh, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> that may be due to cultural pre predisp predispositions and a Buddhist modernism orientation, which eschews non-rational narratives. Most schools pay attention to his awakening, the Bodhi Day. Some schools set aside his birth, and we re celebrate them as the Hanumatsuri flower festival, which is his birth, but far fewer pay attention to the death of Shakyamuni Buddha, the historical character. Each of these events is equally important in what they teach us about the Dharma and ourselves. From a Tendai perspective, it's important that we view the historical Buddha's birth, awakening and death as a continuum. Shakyamuni Buddha's death was the death of the physical being, but he continues to live in his teachings and practices. And we hold not only the sutra, but the marvelous commentary, shastra, and discussions they create as the embodiment of his teachings, his very body, not distinguished from the person himself. And these are some of the sources I used in this. And interesting, the, uh, um, when we look at the difference Bloom, by the way, his translations, which is in a book, Mukyo Denda Koka, so you can get it as a PDF online, um, is a really, really good translation of that. Uh, Mark used to teach at the University of Albany. Um, 